Hey class, uh, good evening. Today is October 1st, 2020 in the year of COVID. And today is the first day of the spookening, as my son William would say. The first day in October, nice weather outside. Uh, everything's going great. Uh, today's lecture is lecture two of unit two. And I call it Choosing Loyalty 1763 to 1776. And let's see how far we can get on with this lecture. Now, remember in the previous lecture, we had talked about the Enlightenment. We can talk about the Seven Years War, uh, which basically ended in 1763. Now, in addition to that, the main beef that the British had with the colonists was that they were trading with the French instead of the British. Now, that's a no-brainer, okay? When the colonists were made to trade with the British, they would get a IOU from the British, okay? Uh, and then later on, what would happen would be that an extra care uh, would pay them, you know, like it could be months later you know and they wouldn't get paid top dollar for everything they would get paid like a going rate you know it wasn't what they wanted so whenever they could the colonists would not trade with the British they would trade with the French and everybody knows why right well because the French had cash they would pay with bullion or they would trade gunpowder or lead or other stuff that they had from England, okay? Because the French needed the supplies to fight the British just as much the British needed the supplies to fight the French, right? And the colonists, one of the things that we need to learn about American colonists and American government in general is that they had no problem selling goods to the French, even though even though they knew they were going to be used against the colonists. Just like I mean, during right before World War II, the Americans or the United States was selling scrap metal to the Japanese almost right up until uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. So we really don't discriminate on who we sell things to even though unfortunately maybe later on they're going to be used against us okay now the british are very critical of this and they know so they increase taxation okay but they only increased it by like maybe one to three percent if you were living in england right now you are going to be taxed about 26 percent okay and this is even the poor people the other thing that they did is that they made it very clear to the colonies that this war had been fought on their behalf that they fought the war to protect them from the french when in reality the american colonists were saying well you know the french never really bothered us you know i mean it didn't it didn't get we didn't start having problems until you kicked the hornet's nest, you know? Now, since they knew that American colonists had engaged in uh, uh, smuggling, what the British are going to do, uh, actually beginning like in 1650, is that they start enacting laws. I mean, the, the first Navigation Act is in 1651. Now, I don't want you to know any of these navigation. I want you to know what they are, but I they, they're they not going to come out on the exam as to like the year, like I have them in the lecture. Okay? So, before 1763, you have got Navigation Acts that, you know, uh, from 1650 and 1660 you know in 1660 they come up with enumerated goods uh, I mean and the reason that they have enumerated goods is that those goods that are enumerated are commodities that can only be traded with England they can, should be traded with anybody else we still have enumerated goods now we just don't call them that okay there's certain things that the United States does not trade with anybody except us and if they do trade it with somebody else then um, 
there is very strict control like the paper that we use to print money in okay you know when you go and buy some of that paper uh i had a friend of mine whose dad used to sell paper uh when people would buy that paper they would actually have to fill out a ledger and say that they bought it and what they were going to use it for okay that would be an enumerated good a controlled item okay now plantation duties they also start doing that by 1673 and 1691 you begin to see the colonists trying to find loopholes not to pay the british these tariffs and these duties so every time that the British would patch or plug a loophole, like uh, if you look at the Navigation Act of 1691, where the Admiralty Courts uh, uh, try to prevent uh, the British, uh, the colonists from smuggling, the colonists always find a way to go around it. Uh, one of my favorite acts is, of course, the Molasses Act. Now, most of us don't start talking about acts until 1764, okay, which is the Sugar Act. But let me talk, tell you about the, the Molasses Act of 1733, and this will give you an idea of how incredibly tricky the colonists were. So one of the things that happens is that there was very little sugar cane being grown in the colonies most if not all the sugar cane was grown in brazil and it was grown in the caribbean okay they would in the caribbean and in brazil they would turn the sugar into molasses and then they would either put it in the barrels or they would crystallize it and send it up here in a solid form where later on all you had to do was just put heat to it and it would melt again okay pilon seal uh, in Mexico, we call brown sugar, you know, the little pyramid-shaped things that are called piloncillo. Okay, so when they would come in, they would tax the colonists if they were moving French sugar or French molasses. And the colonists could always buy French molasses cheaper than they could buy British molasses. I, I, I don't know the reason why. So what they would do is that they would increase the tax on the French molasses like that. They would make up for the money that they had lost when the colonists were not buying British molasses. Well, check out what they would do. The first thing they would do is that they would bribe the customs officials and they would say, we're going to give you a penny and a half for every barrel of molasses that comes in and you don't tax us the full six pennies charge us the tax of two pennies that's what's charged for the british molasses and they would say well yeah because i'm going to get a cut of two pennies and you know he's bringing in a bunch of mola a bunch of barrels of and it wasn't pennies it was pence which was a little bit more than a penny right and then what the what the colonists would do I'm, I'm being long-winded but really bear with me what the colonists would do is that they would get all these molasses and the barrels had french markings on the outside so that's how they were going to get busted that this was french molasses right they would get the molasses they would dump it all out okay dump all the molasses out into these big uh, uh reservoirs okay and then they would turn the barrel staves inside out okay what they would do is basically they would t take the, the french barrels apart and then reassemble them with the french markings to the inside and when they would do that they would put either colonial markings on them or british markings on them right and they would send those molasses barrels to england well here's where it gets really bad <laughs> when they would get to england the british were going to take those barrels apart and turn those staves inside out so they could put their markings on them okay and what would they find <laughs> they would find french markings on them and they realized that they had been had this is why the British were so critical of the colonists because the colonists were always looking for a way to make an extra buck on the colonists and it on the British and it really really pissed them off 
okay now the first act that we ever see that the, the colonists are really going to be concerned about is the sugar act now the sugar act actually drops the tax on all molasses to three pennies so it comes up one penny for british molasses and it comes down three pennies for french molasses so it's going to be three pennies across the board okay and you would think that everybody's happy about that but the problem is going to be there is that they set up a search and seizure system okay and number two they set up admiralty courts to uh, try people that were busted smuggling so what's gonna happen is that instead of going before a jury of your peers you're gonna go before a jury of British naval officers and you're not gonna get off lightly okay the other thing is the writs of assistance which is basically search and seizure which made it easier for the British to hold people that they suspected were smuggling now that's not fair you know but you gotta have to have probable cause to pull somebody over now I know that probable cause can always be like incredibly like flimsy but any I mean any boat leaving Boston or New York you know the harbors of Boston and New York would be deemed as what suspected of smuggling they're going to England so hey they may be smuggling and that really upset them now the colonial response is going to be why are the British exacting more economic control over us when they know that there's a post-war economic depression going on and why are they infringing on our rights and our rights not to be able to refuse search and seizure and many colonists actually welcome these hard times and these overly hard measures because they said well this is a moral re reawakening this is what happens when we do not listen and we smuggle and we don't do what we're supposed to do okay now what's so important about the sugar act is that this is the first time that individuals actually get together and talk about rights liberty and the power of government this is the first time that they say okay well what are we going to do i mean this is 1764 you know it you know 12 years before you know 1776 what are we going to do i mean we have no clue and of course the british are just going to say we're not going to listen to you end of story now the next monumental piece of legislation that is put forth by the british is the stamp act and we have something very similar to the stamp act this is a duty and a lot of people said no no don't worry they're not going to get upset because if this is going to be a direct tax it's not an external tax okay it's it's not an import duty it's not a tax on something that's coming in we're now going to start taxing things that are going on here somebody dies you need to get a death certificate that's going to cost you money somebody dies somebody's born you need a birth certificate that's going to cost you money you need a title to a piece of land that's going to cost you money okay that's why they call it a stamp tax it, ta it taxes paper okay it also puts a tax on consumable items like wheat you know flour uh to tobacco tea uh, all of these things so what's going to happen here is that if you put a tax on something it's going to make the price of those goods go up and unlike we were taught in uh, uh, high school, really the people that begin to demonstrate, that really start everything, are women. And the reason that the women start these issues is because they have less to feed their children with, okay? 
Now, the important thing about this is that it's going to create a political debate that is going to sound like, hey, taxation without representation. Well, let me tell you something about representation, okay? There's no such thing as equal representation in the world. Okay, it, it's always going to it's always going to side the one side more than the other, depending on who's in power. And the British, the, the colonists could not understand that the British were not going to go out of their way under any circumstance to help them before they help the British at home. So this is going to be one of the things that's really going to upset the colonists is that they're going to feel that they have absolutely no representation whatsoever. And they don't. Remember, most of the all of the colonies are being governed by governors who take their orders from parliament, who take who then, of course, uh, uh, responds to the king. OK, so there isn't really. Uh, a situation here where they could have equal representation in parliament okay now what they do what the colonists do have power to do is boycott now i'm not talking about the kind of boycotting that americans do oh we're not going to buy any gas tomorrow because we want to hurt the gas industry but then two days later you decide that you want to go to galveston and you fill your ford f-250 with gasoline all the way to the top and well, they got your gas and money anyway, right? End of story. American colonists were incredibly, incredibly effective because they were true to their boycotting. They would, they would go without. When they said, we're not going to purchase this because of this, then they, they would do that. They would say, like, we're not going to buy any tea. We're going to find something else to drink. Like we're going to make uh, something out of persimmons. We're going to make tea out of, we're going to make some tea out of mint leaves. We're going to do something, but we're not going to buy any tea. And they wouldn't. It was, it was actually a really good uniform effort. And their boycotts are so incredibly effective that in some cases it limited, it, it, uh, it reduced the income of taxes coming in from the colonies by anywhere from 25 to 40 percent and that's a lot now imagine you having your paycheck cut by 25 or 40 percent you know that's going to leave a mark that that's going to be a problem now they're so effective that the british decide to repeal the stamp act okay they repeal the stamp act and then, in their arrogance, they turn around and issue the Declaratory Act. And it's like, in the Declaratory Act, they say, we have the right to impose taxes on you because we're the British, but we're not going to do it right away. We're going to let you know ahead of time that we're going to impose these taxes on you. And like that, it's not going to fall on your lap right away. All right? It's going to be... It's going to take effect in a couple of, of weeks or months or whatever it may be, right? I took my headset off and I hope that it's down here. So I hope that it still works. If not, well, then you're going to have to raise the volume on your uh, computer. I need to get a little podcast microphone, but I'm too cheap to do it, right? I'll get it here soon. Now my hair looks really nice. Look at that. I'm just kidding. Now... What they do after the Declaratory Act is that they come up with something called the Townsend Acts of 1767. And this is really going to do it, okay? The Townsend Acts are imposed customs duties, okay? When you buy some cigarettes and you go across, you know, like some of you that are brown like me or some of you that are not brown like me that are white and you go to Mexico and you buy some bottles over there and alcohol is cheaper over there and then when you bring it back you declare the alcohol and they charge you a small tax right even though the alcohol is cheaper over there you still have to pay the tax on the alcohol that you buy here you've already paid the tax when you when you buy the bottle it's it's built in now 
the same thing is for cars that come in from overseas or anything that comes in from overseas it's going to have a tariff on it and who pays for the tariff we do now they put a tariff or a duty not a duty but a duty okay on english paint lead glass paper and tea and the the colonists get really pissed off you want to know why they get really pissed off because the colonists do not have the mechanism yet, and if they did, they probably wouldn't be allowed to make paint lead or, or smelt lead, uh, founder glass, make paper or tea. That's one of the reasons that the Constitution is not made out of wood pulp, but made out of hemp, because... They actually made the paper there in Philadelphia. You know, they, they and it's actually really cool to make paper. You should you should make it. It's it's it is really cool to make paper. You can make paper out of old paper, you know, just maybe I'll make a video or something. I don't know. But my kids made paper last year and they were really happy with it. And then they got some turkey feathers and cut them and they wrote some really nice, you know, letters to people. I don't know. Now, Parliament chose this course because Benjamin Franklin assured them that the colonists were not opposed to customs duties, that they were only opposed to taxes. I think in his mind he had the best interests of the colonies in mind, but you know what? Americans don't like any type of taxation. You know, We don't like fees, we don't like taxes, we don't like any of that. Yet we want great roads, great schools, great public hospitals, you know, a lot of policemen, a lot of firemen, and all that, but we don't want to pay any taxes. It doesn't work like that. You want good infrastructure, you've got to pay taxes, okay? Uh, if you want to see what a country that pays a lot of taxes and has a really good uh, lifestyle, go to Switzerland. I mean, their tax rate is almost in the 60, in the 60%. But, I mean, you can probably eat off their sidewalks because they're just so incredibly clean and well kept and education is top notch healthcare is top notch you name it all right now what do the colonists say well even though you told us about it you're not actually representing us you're virtually representing us so what we're going to do is that we're going to protest the customs duties that the townsend duties and they do not only did they protest the townsend duties but they also take it upon themselves to humiliate tax collectors and anybody that sided with the British. I mean, these people went around and tarred and feather people. And if your mom decided that she was going to buy, you know, some tea that would harass your mom or harass you. I mean, these were not like great citizens, upstanding citizens. I mean, these were ruffians going around. Listen to me. They were tarring and feathering tax officials. It's not the tax official's fault that he's got to collect the tax. He's just got to collect it. They would pour boiling tar on them, and then they would feather them. You know, I don't know. You know, so, I mean, Maybe some of these people died or something. I mean, it's horrible. That's, that's domestic terrorism. The other thing that they did is that they start a organization called the Sons and Daughters of Liberty. I think in my opinion, that the sons and daughters of liberty are like that close to being a domestic terrorist organization. Because what they would do is that they would go around and terrorize the British tax collectors and anybody that would not listen to them, okay? Now, tensions are going to escalate. You know, a lot of these people would, te you know, at dinner time, they would complain about the British and... Another thing that happens, and it, the, the British never really do well enough to help themselves. They just seem to exacerbate the situation and make it worse for themselves. And one of the things that they do is that they make the colonists have clean hay and a pint of grog or flat beer for the British soldiers so they could sleep there, right? They bring the soldiers so they can, you know, provide protection and 
the soldiers on the weekends or when they weren't working would undercut local labor. You know, let's say, for example, that you would mow somebody's yard for $5 well, they would mow it for 2 because they're already drawing a salary, so they don't need to make as much money as you do. The other thing that happened is that they got paid every month, okay? So that means they had a little bit of money. And in addition to money, they usually had a clean, you know, uniform. And they were, you know, even though these soldiers that were coming over were not the cream of the crop, they were, you know, according to the British, there were a lot of Irish Catholics that would come in. Some of them had been former criminals, but they were still men in uniform, and they were very attractive to a lot of the young ladies in the colonists. So a lot of them would choose to marry them or something. And, of course, then now they're taking your money, they're sleeping in your house, and they're shacking up with your daughter. You know what I mean? So... What they do is a lot of the kids would listen to their parents complaining. And in one case, I've actually been there, okay? They go to a British customs uh, officer, okay? And they start chunking rocks at his, at his window. And the guy comes out with a musket or a, a shotgun that is called a blunderbuss, okay? Those are the ones that have a flared out flared out thing you know like that and um he sees the boys running away and he fires a shot in that direction and it was loaded with buckshot or you know some really big pellets and he hits one of the kids in the back of the head and well he kills him so now now sam adams capitalizes and says you know they're killing, they're, they're taking our women, they're taking our money, they're limiting our voices, and now they're killing our children, you know? So a mob descends on the customs house, and there's some soldiers there that are not well trained, and the colonists start chunking snowballs at them. They were being really sneaky, they were putting rocks inside of them, and they hit one of the guys over the left eye I think and they cut him up and then nobody knows what happens somebody says somebody threw a big chunk of ice somebody says it was um, snowballs somebody says the soldier slipped but somebody fires a shot or a British soldier fired a shot and the rest of the soldiers freak out and they get their uh, brown best muskets and they level them on the colonists and they open up a volley and the first so uh, colonist that dies is an african-american runaway slave by the name of crispus atticus shot him right in the head okay how do i know that that's what i've always been told that he got shot in the head he dies immediately five more colonists are killed they don't reload they just kind of stop there they really don't know what's going on. You know, I think the irony of it all is that the first person killed in the struggle for American freedom is a runaway slave. Now, listen to me. When Sam Adams writes about the bloody massacre, okay, or massacre as it says on the, on the uh, woodcut that he made in his printing press, He's not really sure how people are going to react about the killing of an African American. So he says, the first volley took the unruly Negro Crispus Atticus. So <laughs> even in death, they couldn't they couldn't give Crispus Atticus like full liberation. They had to like, well, he was unruly. He's the one that started it all. You know what I mean? That's why he got shot first. Instead of praising him and saying that, now I've been to his grave and I really should get, you know, look for these pictures that I have on my Facebook account and download them because it is customary to go to the grave there at the Boston Commons in Boston and put a coin as a token of a pre. And it's really, I mean, it's nothing grand. It's like a sidewalk and then a piece of concrete and then some dirt. There's really no 
headstone that divides them. They just say, here lie the five uh, great men that were killed at the Boston Massacre. And it, just like a, you know, generic kind of obelisk looking kind of thing. But still, you know, I mean, it's important. And if I'm not mistaken, John Hancock is also in that in that uh, cemetery. If you're it faces if you're facing north, it's off, John Hancock's grave is off to the left at the very back. I, I, maybe somebody will correct me if, if if it's not there, but I'm pretty sure that's where it's at because I was not very impressed by the cemetery. And then I said, "Well, is anybody else that's famous here?" And they said, "Yeah, you know." John Hancock is over there. So now a lot of people think that uh, this success is going to weaken colonial unity. And it does. Okay, First of all, two of the soldiers are found guilty and their thumbs are branded. Okay, You know, like sometimes criminals have tattoos right here. Well, that's something that the British started, right? Because it's pretty obvious, you know, it was brand new right there. Depending on what they did, it would be a letter. The rest were sent back. The first thing the British do is they repeal the Townsend Act. They only leave the tax on tea. Why? Because the East India Company is in trouble. It's fixing to go bankrupt. And too many people had money invested in the East India Company. So they tell the East India Company, continue to collect the tax on tea and use it so you won't go belly up. The problem is going to be, what's going to be the problem? Well, the problem is going to be that the colonists are not going to be fooled and they're going to say, you're tricking us and they're going to dump that tea into the harbor and that's not a good thing to do, man. I mean, you don't go and get private property and, you know, the price of Budweiser went up. Well, let's go hijack a Budweiser truck and dump it all into the Trinity River. No, you can't do that. <laughs> you just don't do those things. And then to top it off, you don't get dressed like an Indian so they can blame it on the Indians, right? Because maybe you're too chicken to say, I did it, you know? That's not cool, you know? Uh, now, what, it, what, the, what the Boston Massacre does is that people discuss the rights and liberties of representation, but now they're saying, we want representation for people that look like us. The people that have been representing us up to right now to so far are not like me. The closest thing that comes to me is Paul Revere and maybe Sam Adams. But other than that, uh, you know, we're not whining and dining with Ben Franklin or John Adams or Washington. I mean, all these people are way above us. So the last I heard, the people that are getting killed are not, you know, the frou-frou people, not the fancy people. The people that are getting killed are common folks such as you and I. So let's talk about how much freedom do I have because I can't vote. You know, I can't own property. And what do I have coming to me? I mean, we're talking about freedom and liberty and uh the right to uh, of life, liberty, ah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but we have slaves, you know, and so we've got to we got to talk about this now. Right after the Townsend Act, things get really intense. You know, you have the colonists in Rhode Island destroy the revenue schooner, the Gas B, and nobody will say who did it. What they did to the Gas B is that they make they get another boat is smuggling and the boat makes the gas bee follow it and it they make it to where the gas bee runs into a sandbar and then it make everybody get out and they torch it <laughs> well, you, you can't do that if you do that it's like okay i'm gonna go look for a you know the the uh destroyer of the uss fort worth and i'm gonna run it into a sand shoal and then we're gonna we're gonna light it up <laughs> you can't you can't do stuff like that i mean that that's uh, that's bad okay but they do it fearing retaliation after the gas bee what do they do they start the committees of correspondence and this is a clandestine group of individuals that communicates in secret language now this is cool i mean 
of course, they made it to where nobody could trust them. So this is all about secret ink and and you know uh, uh, you know uh, decoding and all that neat kind of stuff, secret meetings and yada yada. And later on, uh, George Washington, who does not like spies, ends up using spies in the American Revolution. Now let's go back to the T and. So what do they do? The T Act of 1773 that is put there just to help the get the East India Company out of trouble. The colonists in many cities preventing the T from being landed in other cities. In Boston, it lands, but it is not taken out. And a hand of a group of men disguised as Native Americans board the ship called the Dartmouth and two other ships, and they dump 342, I think, chests of tea into the harbor, which had the modern day equivalent, and I guess it would be a hell of a lot more back then, of approximately $1 million in tea. Now the British are really pissed off. I mean, like, like your mom got pissed off, you know, like when you got a tattoo and you didn't tell her and then she found out the next day, that kind of pissed off. Now, that kind of pissed off if you were Mexican, right? Like, your mom woke you up with a chancla, like, wham, man. You know, my wife, she was about to give my kids a time out or something like that. Now, that's how mad they were, all right? They were mad to where it was inconceivable. But they said, you know what? We're not going to punish all of the colonies. We're just going to punish Boston. And like this, the rest of the colonies won't get mad. And if they don't get mad, we don't have any problems. So they pass a lot of really, really repressive acts on the port of Boston. They shut the port of Boston. They passed the Administration of Justice Act, which means that British officials did not have to be tried in the colonies if they killed a colonist. They could be sent back to England, okay? Now, the one that really messed them up this time was the Quartering Act of 1774. Now the British declare, we don't need just a barn with clean hay. If you have an empty room in your house, we have the right to put a British soldier in there. Okay, by this time, the British had already sent British soldiers of the line that were well-trained, well-oiled, well-trained, you know, good soldiers. Not soldiers that had become soldiers out of necessity, but soldiers that had become soldiers because that's what they wanted to do. And that was very frightening to the colonies. I've read accounts where they could tell the difference between the colonists and uh, the, the not the colonists, they could tell the difference between the uh, con conscripted soldiers and those that chose to be soldiers, okay? There was also a greater presence in Boston of these soldiers, okay? Now, instead of it backfiring on them, it helps because all of the other colonies are very sympathetic. They say, oh, you're ganging up on Boston. That's not really cool. You know, what do you expect us to? We didn't want your teas. We weren't going to drink it. So, you know, it's not cool what you're doing. And thus has the first meeting in a Philadelphia of the First Continental Congress. Okay. Future country leaders meet there. And they approve a continental association to boycott British goods. And they defeat Joseph Galloway's plan of union, but approve John Adams' declaration of rights and grievances. And this is where the Declaration of Independence will come. And it is a document that puts forth their ideals on customs duties and taxation. Because that's what this is all about. Okay? Now... What's going to happen here is that they're not going to, the British are not going to listen. And I think what's really unnerving about the First Continental Congress is that they do not allow Georgia to have any representatives in the First Continental Congress. Does anybody know why? 
you know, I could say if you tell me in the next exam or if you send me, you know what? If you send me an email and you tell me why Georgia was not allowed to have any delegates at the First Continental Congress, I will give you five points on the on exam two, okay? And don't share it with anybody because I'll find out. I mean, this is not an easy answer, but it's also not hard. And you can tell me in one sentence. So th th you're getting a bonus if you watch the lecture. And if you send me the answer, then poof, you get five points on the next exam. You just have to remind me about the points, I'll give, and I'll give them to you, okay? But I'm not going to tell you. Why wasn't Georgia allowed to have any delegates at the First Continental Congress? Decision for independence, okay? They're still like, well, you know, they're bigger than us. We don't know if we really want to fight. Uh, maybe we shouldn't do this. So, the, the monumental moment is going to be April of 1775, you know, and this is one of the things that I have not been able to do when I go to, when I've gone to Boston. I've only been there twice. I don't want to make, make it sound like I've been there a lot. Yeah, I've only been there twice, okay? So, I don't want to make it sound like I've been there a lot of times. Have I been there twice or have I been there one time? I don't remember, okay? So, I need to go again anyway, okay? Like I said, in your life, you have to go to New York at least once you have to go to philadelphia at least once and you have to go to boston at least once and you have to go to washington dc but not right now not in 2020 go like later maybe 2021 or after that but but the most important thing is that you need to go to those four places i guarantee you, you'll go back to one or two philadelphia is wonderful boston is wonderful new york you just have to go it's so cool now one of the things that they begin to do is that they really don't want to start a fight with the British. I mean, this is serious, man. I mean, there could be some bloodshed here. There's already been some. Well, the decision to start the war is actually handed to the American colonists, okay? It's not something that the colonists run to do. But the British don't help it either. There is a general by the name of General Gage, and he decides that he's going to start collecting powder and cannon that was stored in different colonial towns. In this case, Lexington and Concord. It was it was customary for the British to send, you know, a three pound cannon, not a big eight or ten pounder, but usually a three pound cannon. Uh, small brass cannon they actually weren't very big you know and some powder to scare the Indians away you know the Indians decided that they were gonna come over they would they would get this cannon and load it with grape shot or two with a bunch of screws or rocks or something and fired into the Indians and it would send them away but they'd been there a long time they probably also had a variety of sundry weapons there that weren't in the best of shape either okay so he says, I'm going to go get these. Now, there's another general, I believe General Howe, tells him, look, don't go get these, man. You're, you're walking into a hornet's nest. The, the powder is probably wet. It's not good. And the cannon, I mean, they're three pounders. Yeah, they can hurt us, but it's not worth it. Don't, don't, don't get involved in this situation. Well, of course, he does not listen. And not, not only does he not listen, but he gets 700 British soldiers to recover this stuff, okay? So they start right at, right at dawn, okay? And they start marching over there, and they get to Lexington, and this is with one it by land, and two it by sea, the British are coming, the British are coming, Paul Revere. So they get word, you know, the cat's out of the bag, you know, they're, they're on their way. And they get the powder, they get the guns, they get the cannon, and they scurry away with it. When they get to Concord, it's like, I mean, to Lexington, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, this is, uh, there's nothing here. So what happens is that about 70 Minutemen face off 
with the British, okay? And the British at this time, you know, set up rank and file. They're intimidating as everything. Somebody fires a shot, but nobody knows who it was. The British open up. They fire a volley. Eight minute men are dead. One red coat is wounded. And they make it to Concord where they do recover some munitions, okay, but not all of them, okay. Now, by the time that they get to Concord, the column is kind of strung out. These 700 men are no longer in a compact column or compact columns. They're strung over the not 16-mile march, but, you know, between Lexington and from Concord to Boston, it's 16 miles. It's about 12 miles to Lexington. I may be wrong, okay? I know Brian Johnson knows my boss because he's run that marathon and he's run that back and forth because he does stuff like that because he's not right at the head. He's like Forrest Gump. He just runs forever, okay? He, he runs so much that they, like, one time found him on the side of the street, you know, passed out. You know, I'm not lying either, okay? It's a glutton for punishment. Now, what we have here is that these redcoats are stretched out. By the time they get to Concord, I mean, there's a hornet's nest there. They're pissed off. A lot of the colonists do not have weapons, okay? So at Concord, they, again, there's another skirmish. And the British say, you know what? We need to get the hell out of here. It's time to go. So they turn around at Concord and they start marching back. But what the colonists do is that they have a pretty effective method of communication and they start just picking them off from the side of the road. They're hiding in the trees. Remember, these Minutemen had lived in colonial America by now for a hundred years this was six seventh generations okay i mean some of these people got here in the 1620s 1650s so they had grown up fighting indians so what they did is that they came up with a style that had military tactics in it but that also had a frontier indian flavor to it and they never met a superior adversary toe to toe, you know. And by the time that the first British get back to Boston from Lexington and Concord, the colonists or the Yankees had killed 273 Redcoats. That is a third of, that's what they had killed. Okay, that's not counting the wounded. I mean, this is it. There's no going back from this one, okay? And the column was stretched out for 16 miles, okay? I mean, and what makes it worse is that they would kill a red coat and then a frontiersman would come out and pick up his brown vest and his weapons and use their own weapons against them. So it is, it is, it, it, I mean, I think it's ingenious. Don't get me wrong, okay? But, when they get back, the Second Continental Congress convenes in Boston and they're like, oh man, we really messed up this time. Now, instead of, you know, declaring war, they decide to send an olive branch petition. Ben Franklin says, you know what, let's try it one more time, man. I mean, for all it's worth, you know, let, let's just ask. So they send an olive branch petition, and they basically are asking the British, please don't kick our butt, okay? We'll do whatever you want to, just remove the British soldiers from Boston, repeal the coercive acts that you have against Boston, and let's renegotiate, okay? And the British say, nah, it's not going to happen. Sorry, King George is really pissed off by now and he decides to send a small armada to Boston. You know, I think the initial one was, uh, the first time that British soldiers came, it was something like 3,000. 
this time we're looking at 25,000 soldiers coming over um, with approximately I think 80 ships of the line that come in the first time a British ship of the line is the equivalent of an American modern day aircraft carrier okay now they're like really scared and I would be too you know it's like we're fixing to get our butt to look really bad and I really don't know what to do well, what are we gonna do well I don't know Thomas Paine just said that the little pamphlet says that time has come for America to become independent you know and of course in June of 1776 the Second Continental Congress considers a resolution to declare independence but they can't seem to get a majority of nine votes okay you have some colonies like Rhode Island and Connecticut and Delaware some of the smaller ones that did not want to have anything to do with this fight other people were saying, hey, how can we declare independence if we have African Americans enslaved? Okay, it's inconsistent with liberty. Okay, on the other hand, the British are telling the slaves, if you retaliate against the Americans and you take our side, then we'll give you freedom. We actually are free now because we said Native Americans' response is far from uniform. They really don't like the Americans, but the British say, if you help us fight them, then we'll give you back some of your ancestral lands, which is a lie, of course, right? But it doesn't hurt to do that. And believe it or not, on July the 4th, when the Declaration of Independence is finally ratified, not by all 13 colonies, but by nine, what you will have is that fewer than 50% of the colonists actually support the American side and the war. It's closer to 40%. Okay? 40% didn't support it. I mean, 40% supported it. 20% were uh, still sided with the British, so that makes 60%. And the other 40% couldn't care less. It's like, you know what? I really don't have any time to fight this. I got to feel the potatoes that I need to plow, so... You know, and my wife just died of scurvy, and, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of in the market for another wife. I really don't want to go off and fight any kind of revolution because it's really not going to do any good, right? So, where do we go now, or what's going on now, all right? I'm sorry I keep glancing over there, but it's like I really like a grade C science fiction film that my son sent me to watch and it's so incredibly cheesy because it's like really bad you know what i mean i'll tell you what the name of it is so you can watch it but you can tell they made all their props well they always make their props anyway they're on on movies and i'm not all right so what do i want you to know now well the war starts the first major battle there's only a few battles that i want you to know the first major battle, the, the one that starts it is Lexington and Concord, and you have to know it because shot heard around the world. That's the one that starts everything. Tolpedo starts the whole shebang. Second one I want you to know is Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill. I've been there. It's just a, it's a hill with a bunch of houses now in it, right? It's like a battlefield and it's a lot of cool houses on it, all right? has no significance whatsoever. The only significance is is that the colonists open a can of whoop a on the British and the British realize this is not going to be a cakewalk. This is not going to be a six month war. These people can fight once they dig in. And it's true. Americans under the right tutelage and the right command can open a can of whoop a. Okay. The next one that I want you to know is I want you to know Valley Forge and I want you to know Valley Forge because it is a moral victory okay this is when Washington brings in Baron von Steuben or Steuben okay now Baron von Steuben had been asked to leave the Prussian military because of his homosexuality okay and Washington says I don't care if he's gay the dude's a 
a soldier and he can whip an army into shape. Send him over here to me. So he comes to Valley Forge and as my colleague and great professor Paul Johnson told me, he arrives at Valley Forge uh, in a sleigh being pulled by four Clydesdales and he is there wrapped up in some furs with his lover and of course the uh, from what I understand, the, the the furs and all the stuff was purple, and the sleigh had jingle bells on it and all that. So, you know, here comes a, you know, 18th century Liberace coming in the Valley Forge where men are dying from smallpox, cholera, and you name it. And what does von Steuben do? The first thing he does is like, hey, man, if you all are going to poop in the river... You can't poop upstream of the river. You got to poop downstream of the river because if you poop in the river and then you drink water out of the river without boiling it, you're going to die of cholera, okay? So you can't do that, all right? The next thing he does is that he separates the men, okay, into companies. And then he has the men, you know, demonstrate what they know and out of every batch of 100 men, he picks out the best soldier. And then he takes those men, which I think I remember was more or less like 100 total. He trains them individually, okay? He trains them, and he says, this is what I want you to do. And then he tells them to go train the rest of the army, okay? And he creates an enlisted service. In other words, the men aren't mixing together. He creates rank, you know. And before Washington was walking around the men, listening to grievances, he says, Washington, you don't do that kind of stuff, man. You're, you're to be heard and not seen, okay? Well, now, Washington still doesn't listen to him that much, but he understands the importance. So, oh my gosh, can you imagine? The United States Army Training Manual oh, was written by a homosexual. Now, I can't imagine how many heads will explode after I said this. I have no problem. I don't care if the guy was gay. The guy could fight. And George Washington didn't care either. So he said, you know what? If he can fight and he can help me whip an army into shape, then that's the guy I want here. And you see this when he gets to Cobb. Do you see this when he gets Marquis de Lafayette? And he, you know, he gets Coscusco. So he brings in generals from abroad. And one of the things that I tell my students, you know, uh, uh, Governor Galvez, uh, Galvez uh, actually takes the port of New Orleans to keep the British from coming up underneath him and attacking them. A Spanish, a Spaniard, Right, who's now Galveston is named after, secured the port of New Orleans for George Washington. The Sultan of Turkey, okay, it wasn't Turkey then, but one of the sultans of what now is present day Turkey sends George Washington the equivalent of $10,000 in gold for him to fight the British. So Washington was connected, okay. He, he was connected. He had never he never he had never won a battle <laughs> up up to Valley Forge, but he was connected, you know, and he commanded that authority and he commanded that. You know, like Lafayette was like nineteen or twenty when he's fighting for for um, Washington. He's a little kid. He was out there kicking butt. Now after Valley Forge, I want you to know Saratoga. Because that's when the French get inv involved, okay? Basically, what they do is that they give the Americans weapons, shoes, powder, and generic clothing. Now, they didn't do it because they liked the Americans. They kind of liked the Americans a little, but they hated the British, okay? Now, what's going to be the bad thing about this? Well, guess what? After the revolution is over... They decide that they're not going to pay them back. They just decide, we're not going to pay you, so what are you going to do about it? Now, the next one I want you to know is Yorktown. And Yorktown is when Cornwallis, uh, the siege, 
at Yorktown and Cornwallis surrenders his sword to George Washington. Now, I thought it was kind of cheesy that Cornwallis didn't come and surrender his sword himself. And I also thought it was kind of lame that George Washington didn't say, I want you to send Cornwallis to give me. Basically, Cornwallis sends his sword, he gets on a ship, and the French allow him to pass. The reason they were able, the American colonists were able to beat Cornwallis at Yorktown is because the British were bombarding Yorktown from one side and the colonists were hitting it from the other side. So they had nowhere to go. It was just, it was over. And by this time, the revolution had been going on for, you know, a whopping eight years. Up to Vietnam, it had been the longest war that the United States had been involved in. And then was Vietnam, and then, of course, the war in Afghanistan, you know, has superseded that because, you know, that has been going on since the Bush administration. You know, they say it's already over, but it's not. But anyway, Vietnam was 10 years, and this one we're going on, what, like 16 or, no, wait. Yeah, I think it's 16. I'm not sure. Now. They end the war with the Treaty of Paris of 1783, all right? And what happens here is that it doesn't really end the war. It just ends the hostilities. The British are going to pull back into the Great Lakes. They're going to be like in, uh, in Maine. They're going to harass American colonists and shipping, okay? This is going to lead to another war. In addition to that, uh, the Americans would not open to any negotiations unless they got uh, recognition from the British. And the British say, yeah, you can get recognition. You know, we're tired of dealing with you all, whatever. Now, the treaty gives the United States a lot of territory. Not to the Miss. Well, I would say to the Mississippi. There was still some disputes going on, um, you know, uh, with the proclamation line of 1763. But now you pretty much go all the way to the Mississippi, but you don't get Louisiana and you don't get parts of Florida down in the bottom. You know, later on, you're going to get with the Louisiana Purchase, you're going to get, of course, all that's west of the Mississippi all the way to the Mexican Secession. All right. And this is important because this is going to create, you know, a westward movement. And it's also going to create a lot of problems between the colonies of who this land belongs to and who collects the money when we sell it. We're going to talk about that in the next lecture, okay? Now, Americans also win access to the Newfoundland fisheries. That's very important, people. People didn't eat a lot of, the wealthy people didn't eat fish at the time. But, a lot of the colonists would trawl for cod and they would salt it and sell it to the Caribbean so they could feed slaves. So it was it was food for the slaves. They would make bacalao out of it or salt cod. You can buy it like at Fiesta and specialty stores. It stinks really bad. It's basically raw fish that they split down the middle and then they pack it in salt and it dries out and it doesn't spoil. It's, that's what they do for preservation, right? And the last thing is the vague terms in the treaty set the stage for future problems between the two nations that are going to lead to the War of 1812, okay? Now, when we come back, we're going to build a virtuous republic, whatever that means. I mean, what kind of a republic are we going to be? You know, we all know that a republic didn't work for the Romans because it became corrupt, right? And, of course, a republic, quasi-republic, under Henry VIII, right? So we don't know if that's what we want to do, but we can't have a democracy because we can't trust people with a vote. So we're going to have to come up with a plan. We're going to have to come up with something that is a combination of both, and students, the United States is a democratic republic. That's what we are. At the lower levels, we pick our officials or our politicians via, you know, 50 plus one. And 
for the president, we have an electoral college that responds for us, okay? I don't think that that's the best, you know, in the world, but it's the best that we have right now. And, and it seems to work sometimes, right? Now, we also have to look at those individuals whose only interest is economic, that say, if we create a country that is economically sound, then everything else is going to fall in place. So if we allow individuals to have self-interest cited as the number one thing that they need to do, then we're going to be okay. Because those people, everybody's going to work out for them, and then we're going to pay taxes and we're going to be a strong republic. But it, it doesn't work that way because you're going to have to have people in the lower rungs that are going to have to work to get those people to be wealthy. So there's got to be a balance, and it's going to be an economic, a democratic, and a republic balance, okay? Um, and then, of course, the question of who votes and who doesn't vote. But I am at an hour and five minutes and actually a little bit into the next unit. So when I come back, I'm going to pick up with creating Republican government and state constitutions. Okay, And we basically are going to frame the Constitution the next time I come talk to you. And then in the following lecture, I will talk about Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian uh, Hamiltonian federalism and Jeffersonian republicanism and I will tell you right now I am not going to cover the war of 1812 in the lecture you're going to have to read about it on your own okay and it'll still be on your exam so we basically have two more lectures that I'll try to hammer out this week your exam will be on October the in you know, the week of October the 12th so we still have a while uh, be safe be kind to each other and wear your masks, and I'm going to continue to watch this corny movie that my son told me about. You all take care, be kind to each other, uh, wear your masks. <laughs>